Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello, and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hey guys, Dr. Santos here, pediatric infectious disease doc, researcher, you know it. Radio enthusiast. <laughs> uh, I wish I had one of those quirky things like ham radio, like, you know, I don't know why, I, but I, I very much want an eccentricity like <laughs> I can be like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a physician and I like music and I, I like to talk to truckers over ham radio. <laughs> I mean, there's a sitcom for you right there. Trucker doc. Oh, trucker doc. <laughs> Rolling down the asphalt going to have, no, that's the South Park. That's the South uh, Park, yeah. <laughs> what, would, what would trucker doc's theme song be, uh, do it's, you suppose? Uh, so you'd have to tell me if it was a trucker who is a doctor or if he's a doctor who takes care of truckers because based on that premise uh, both. i've got like both <laughs> he travels um, he travels the highways and byways of every yeah. great land looking for truckers in need of medical care <laughs> Yeah, who yeah. Drive that extra couple miles. There you go. <laughs> to so an urgent just... care or hospital. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it could be something like old Dr. Josh was in his clinic working mighty fine until one day he decided that he wanted to ride the line, you know, and, you know, something, something. And he, he got <laughs> himself a handle and he picked him up a load. There you go. <laughs> Set out on for a call sign, and then he hit the road. There you go. Yeah, trucker, yeah, yeah. Trucker dock. Trucker dock. <laughs> and then, you know, the next verse is riding down the speedway towards Texarkana there, and he saw an injured partner. But this pause and, in the air, and that's how he gets a sidekick. <laughs> He pulled on over and said, don't you worry, I'm the trucker doc. <laughs> trucker doc. Okay. The trucker doc. And then, and then he, he patches up that guy, and then that's the start of him being trucker doc. Because now, you know. <laughs> Just delivering people. Just delivering. And supplies. Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 he delivers the rebar. He says, oh, what's wrong with your back? Oh, trucker doc, it's been aching since... You know, mile marker 54 off of Denver. You know? So you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> but moving yeah. on to our actual topic this yeah. week. <laughs> Is any of this going to stay in the episode? Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> we'll bring back Trucker Doc a little bit later. But for <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, right uh, now, yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought up Trucker Doc because, you know, as we're trying to contemplate the theme music for Trucker Doc, that does touch on our actual episode topic today, which, of course, is music and medicine. Now, I don't Ooh, just mean yes. music therapy. I'm looking at a broad range of therapies. There's a lot more to using music and medicine than you may think at first glance. Yeah, I think a lot of people go with, you know, what the, their first idea with music therapy is that it's something like, Oh, we're going to do some soothing. Maybe if you're in pain or discomfort, you know, you play some music or something like that. And you work with a certified therapist to work through anxiety or, or uh, something like this. But that's actually just, I think, one narrow application of how music therapy can help heal. So uh, let's start by uh, taking a quick cruise in the Wayback Machine. Are we going to head on down the road, Josh? <laughs> way back machine coming way back. <laughs> so. Oh, my God. If Trucker Doc had a way back machine. <laughs> Greek physician Hippocrates. Yes. Or in Bill and Ted speak, Hippocrates was among the first to recognize music as a potential therapy 
and play it for mental health patients as early as 400 BC. And that oh, was wow. kind of one of the starting points. Part of that's from the Greek island of Mycenae, mm -hmm. where the god Pajawo used holy song to cure disease. And of course, Apollo was the god of both music and medicine. Yeah, I always remember that association, but I couldn't remember where it had come from. That's amazing. So, I mean, millennia ago, we were, we were using music for therapy. That's so cool. There is even a record of a Greek poem from the 6th century about a plague in Sparta being stopped and cleansed by the music of the famous composer Thaletus. Full. Very. Like, Beyonce is pretty famous, but is she... Yeah. Stop a plague, famous. <laughs> and of course, you know, this is a historical recounting. Can't be 100% accurate if this was real. I'm pretty sure it wasn't just from what I know about limits of music therapy. Like so. Taylor Swift is Crash Ticketmaster famous. Yes. But is she end the pandemic fame? Well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> She might be. Actually. She might be. She might be. You know what? We I had would a throw... horrible worldwide pandemic, and then Tay Tay went on tour, <laughs> and the emergencies were declared over. <laughs> There's a direct correlation between Taylor Swift hitting the stage and then Biden declaring the, the national emergency over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Over here in America was Ben Franklin, Ooh, who, yeah. you know how when you like wet your finger and rub it around the rim of a glass you get that you get different tones yeah especially if it's like crystal stemware you know if it's really nice you know crystal glass then it'll ring it'll have a tone to it and that tone will change based on the amount of water you have in there or liquid i always picture miss congeniality like sandra bullock oh, playing. yes she played so, the, yeah yeah for her talent so it wasn't just sandra bullock it was also ben franklin who invented his own version <laughs> of an instrument, like an instrument version of wetting your finger and putting it on the glass. And it looks, when you look it up, it looks like a rotisserie. It's what? called an, it's called an harmonica, a like, well, harmon <laughs> like harmonica, but like, okay. without the H and it's <laughs> Ben Franklin's glass harmonica. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's it's actually nothing related to the like the harmonica that you and I think of that you blow into. No, but we'll get to that later. Okay, got it. Um, but yeah, he he invented his own version so you could play multiple glasses at once instead of having oh. them all lined up. Okay. And initially it was like a big and then, you know, it supposedly it cured some princess on her deathbed who went on to live another 60 years. Uh, <laughs> But in a more, slightly more modern era, musicians during World War I contributed to the effort, much as musicians and entertainers do today to the military, by playing for wounded soldiers in veterans' hospitals. This wasn't a certified therapist or anything like this. This was just... This is before that existed, and I'm glad you bring that up, because okay. originally, you know, just imagine you're, you're playing at your local jazz joint. Right. Um, and then you're like, oh, the the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. <laughs> okay. And they went and played for these veterans, and the soldiers responded so well that the National Association for Music in Hospitals was founded in 1926. Okay. And they then began getting special accreditations so they could be hospital performing musicians. And over time, they evolved into the very first music therapists. Oh, wow. Okay, gotcha. Now, we've moved from music therapists, which we still have today, to as recent as 2018. Sure. The... A physician at the Vienna Medical University started looking at music as, for use as a digital therapy. So okay. looking at a clarinet concerto by Mozart and yes. the effects it had on, on your physiology, your respiratory rate, your heart rate. Just this month, a collaboration with sound therapists has been shown to help slow heart rate, reduce blood pressure, 
and lower lower stress levels, which I think we all know music does for most of us, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or and it amps you it, up or does a variety of things. <laughs> it does. Uh, I think it does depend on the style of music uh, and the cultural context a little bit, you know, with uh, you know, how it works out. But yes, I, I agree with you. By and large, if it's the right style of music for, you know, being aimed at soothing a person, then it tends to work out. Like it's, its effect is pretty strong. So let's get into some of our different studies that show the ways music and musicality are used, maybe outside of a typical music therapist or what you might think of the love of a music therapist. Right. So one example, very common, lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, emphysema, asthma, any any range of lung problems. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. The Brits conducted a small study on suspicion that an instrument known as the harmonica not the glass one, not Ben yep. Franklin. Now we're, we're <laughs> put, I know it's London, but we're putting the H back in. You know, the, the harmonica. The what? The harmonica. <laughs> like apostrophe A M. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, like, like the, how, um, like a Cockney person would say, harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I said. So, <laughs> t- so to test this Paul Monica. Yeah, sure. um, they recruited eight participants, so very small, barely even a pilot study, more okay. a proof of concept, um, recruited eight participants from with COPD from a 30-person harmonica group established for people with respiratory diseases. Right. So the diagnosis had been made, you know, we, we knew their pulmonary function, et cetera. The group then met weekly for one-hour sessions that consisted of warm-up exercises, followed by the singing of songs appropriate for individuals who may become breathless. And additionally, all participants had participated in singing for lung health groups. Oh, oh, uh, so they had been in kind of these programs before? Yeah, so this is a very cherry-picked sort of group on on this study. Got it, got it. So they basically, they knew what they were doing. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are actually a variety of studies that do look into it. And the main way this theory is thought to work from a rehabilitation standpoint is yeah. that it works very similar to an incentive spirometer, which is what we a device we have in the hospital that we use to sort of recruit additional lung cells. Following surgery, when parts of your lung have to kind of say, wake up, you use an incentive spirometer to reinflate. And a harmonica acts in a similar method as you learn how to breathe to create the notes. Using a metered dose inhaler, just like you do in asthma, requires coordination and a sufficient effort, as does playing the harmonica. Yeah. And so what that essentially means, you need to be able to breathe deeply enough and you need to be able to breathe properly so that you don't gag, choke, um, swallow in the midst of the breath. So on the inspiration, you're drawing down your diaphragm and expanding your chest on the expiration or breath out, you are demonstrating a positive pressure that's what creates the notes and that's what sort of helps to wake up and recruit those additional lung cells yeah so recruitment like it's not in the it's not like in the military right so uh you've got <laughs> uncle your lung wants you yeah <laughs> Well, actually, Uncle Blood wants you because the yeah. lung to get the oxygen. No, that that sounds join creepy. join but, the circulatory system. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> join the cardiopulmonary system. So, uh, you know, you've got your big gigantic airways, and you have to imagine them as an upside down tree. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they end in microscopic little uh, cul de sacs. You know, just like at the end of a street, and those are lined with one cell layer thick sacks, you know, and, and that allows for oxygen to diffuse into your bloodstream and carbon dioxide to diffuse out. Well, those little, little tiny endpoints right there, 
if we don't breathe deeply enough for a longer period of time, they close off, they close down. And now you haven't, you don't have access to those areas of your lung. So they're unrecruited. They're you know, they're kind of dead spaces. So recruiting means opening those spaces back up again so that, you know, teeny tiny little oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules can diffuse across there and the lung can do its job properly or that little patch of lung right there. So that's what the recruitment is, is you're literally like popping them open. Pop, pop, pop. Now, that's a very small pilot program, but the use of a harmonica as a medical device is actually apparently fairly widely accepted based on the number of studies that showed up with it. And there's even one particular company that has partnered with one of the oldest harmonica makers to make a special pulmonica that has, yeah. <laughs> I guess, an extra division to better reproduce one, four, seven, eight breathing or other pulmonary rehab exercises. So, oh, okay. So this one is okay. It's, it's basically standardized. So you get a little pulmonica in my life, (laughs) a respiratory therapist by my side, a little bit of rehab's all I need, need. a little bit of music's all I see. (laughs) But a little bit of air makes me expand. A little yeah. bit of breath and I'm inspired. Expand uh, my lungs so I don't get tired. Yay! <laughs> no, it's fantastic. The The act of positive end expiratory pressure, so at the very end, when we, when we finish exhaling a breath, all the way out, there is a little bit of back pressure that we naturally you know, have and generate. And that's supposed to keep those little extra air sacs open, which is why, Josh, it's actually impossible just in a a normal situation for you to completely exhale. Like you can't close down your lungs all the way. You, You know, the physics won't let you. So if you do have that happening, though, those little close downs because of illness, because of pathology, then you recruit those back by providing that end expiratory pressure. You put something in front, in this case, a uh, pulmonica. So it's not just playing the harmonica, because I think we all know that you can't play the harmonica and not sing along, preferably in as gravelly a voice as possible. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, and you got to talk about how you lost your dog and your only love out in a desert from the day the From the day you was born. Da, 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 da. The day you was born, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So my mom, I had to put sausages around my neck so the dog would play with me. It got me to thinking. All right, if there's a medical harmonica, yeah, is there anyone out there, any researcher who would grant my wish and find a treatment use for karaoke? Or I'm sorry, karaoke. Kara, karaoke, yeah, yeah. So because, you know, playing the harmonica is one great way to, you know, expand the old lungs. But your favorite is, is you know, singing badly into a microphone in a tiny little room full of sake. Singing badly? No, no, no. Oh, no, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> dropping, uh, the, yeah. dropping the truth bombs tonight. I'm not. I'm not. He has a beautiful voice. He <laughs> sings so well. Sorry, sorry. You Kara, trying to okay. pick up the translation? <laughs> <laughs> it means, em- hey, it means empty voice, jackass. Oh, I'm sorry. Look it up. Because I, I knew the, the, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The urban myth that uh-huh. karaoke is Japanese for singing badly, which I guess I'm totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Karapo means empty or void. And oke okay comes from the word oke sutra, which is orchestra. So it's, so it refers that that karaoke is the actual machine that has no voice and then you add the voice i am so sorry <laughs> if only karaoke <laughs> could be a feasible alternative therapy for pulmonary rehabilitation <laughs> for copd was the title of this paper i found while i was thinking about my dream look okay. look let's just get into other people 
how yes. singing badly can make them. <laughs> <laughs> this was so cool, Josh. You sent me uh, this article, and the neat thing about it is the there was an original reference article in the European Respiratory Journal, um, which I think was in Denmark, and they were talking about using singing for lung health. And then there was a commentary on it, which was really beautiful by a group in Japan that said, oh, you know, this is really good that you're doing singing rehab, but you can't always get a rehab group together. But, you know, we have this thing called karaoke. And it, do I loved this article that you sent over to me because a good chunk of this article is explaining what karaoke is <laughs> to all the ignorant Westerners. <laughs> and what, what is it? What is it, Santosh? Oh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> Karaoke is a type of interactive entertainment where people sing along to recorded music using a microphone. It has become a popular leisure activity for several people worldwide following the development of the karaoke machine in Japan in the 1970s. It allows patients to practice singing without going to medical facilities. Okay, listen to this. Singing loudly at home may cause inconvenience to our family, whereas in a karaoke box, we can sing without any worries. There are machines that give us a score for our singing ability at karaoke, which helps increase motivation. Tell them about the thing, because there was an actual trial in Denmark, and then after that, the wonderful group in, in Japan, uh, Yuge et al., uh, Miz uh, Mizuki Yuge did a commentary in the same journal, European Respiratory Journal, talking about how you can add on karaoke. <laughs> so that, so a, that standardized, can... a standardized 10-week regimen of yes. karaoke. Yes. Which, exactly. Now, this was a much larger <laughs> study than the British one, uh, which had 270 COPD patients with mm -hmm. 195 that completed the study across yeah. all demographics pretty balanced mm -hmm. yeah uh, it was it was really fantastic and um and, and it they... basically showed now i couldn't find exactly what they were saying i mean presumably japanese music <laughs> it could have been yeah they split them into singing for lung health and physical exercise training like running and all that kind of a thing you know the 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 normal type um, but yeah, it, they, they registered with the, you know, clinicaltrials.gov and everything else like that. I actually, you're right, Josh, I couldn't find out. Oh, here we go. Um, the intervention was developed by professional singing teachers who had been trained, um, by the UK singing for lung health program, which is an actual, it's a codified program. Um, each session consisted of 20 minutes of physical warm-ups, 20 minutes of vocal warm-ups with rhythm and pitch games, 40 minutes of singing, which they didn't specify, and a 10-minute cool-down. Yeah, see, like it's the 40 minutes of singing that's the black box for me. Like, yes, yeah, yeah. Is it know. opera? Is it Taylor <laughs> Swift? Is yeah, it... Did they, did they sing Aha? You know, like a little take on me? <laughs> I mean, did they, or did they do some Missy Elliott? All the <laughs> well, no, because rapping Absolutely. rapping is almost as complicated, if not more so, than playing the harmonica. If you're talking about controlled breathing exercises, that's true. Absolutely, yes. But right now, it is a little bit of a black box. I didn't go back to see what the singing for lung health program is the the united kingdom one that's actually codified i'm guessing they have all of the repertoire and stuff in there but i didn't go back well, to look <laughs> anyway moving on to yeah. the obvious one mood and pain control yeah, yeah. Research. <laughs> well you know music right. can make you, you feel what happened, though. huh you got to tell them what happened for the singing with the lung health Oh, it was non-inferior to physical therapy, to, to normal pulmonary rehab. So it yeah. wasn't necessarily any better, but it actually wasn't any worse. So yeah. if you are if you are a serious karaoke connoisseur, mm -hmm. you're you you're can, rehabbing. <laughs> yeah. You're you're building up your ability. Um, <laughs> now if that doesn't it. improve so your mood, this might. Researchers yeah. at the University of Pennsylvania found that medication can be just as good 
as or music can be just as good as medication for calming patients facing surgery with a specific musical piece. I love this. This this trial was for basically music versus actual pain medication, which I believe they did a Scrubs episode about. Yes. Well, uh, um, that the, that was a different one, Josh. They tried hypnosis. Oh, hypnosis, right? Yeah, yeah. Instead so, of anesthesia for so this, an appendectomy patient, which didn't work. <laughs> so this clinical trial involved 157 patients, randomized to receive either Versed, which is a typical sedative, or mm-hmm. to yep. listen to Marconi Union's Weightless series considered to be some of the most relaxing music and this is the best part available (laughs) so yeah not that weaponized you know top secret relaxation music that the pentagon keeps locked up at fort knox (laughs) this is this is the most relaxing you know we could find on short notice (laughs) from the from the back (laughs) That's so good. Oh, my gosh. So this was published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, and it showed actually that music was similar to Versed in reducing anxiety before a procedure like a peripheral nerve block. So not not major surgery. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) This is one where, for instance, like hand surgery, you know, like if you were getting a release for a trigger finger um, or if you had carpal tunnel. And so in those, you're actually awake and they do, uh, you know, a nerve block, you know, just to to basically numb up the area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're not put all the way under. Now, that was, you know, again, a small study, which basically was limited to only lasting three minutes chosen for the time for to peak effectiveness is Versed. And the midazolam or the Versed group rated their satisfaction overall higher. So even though there was no physical difference, uh, a slightly larger study looked at 41 surgical patients following surgery. So this was not to get them ready for surgery, but in the ICU, they got 50-minute music listening sessions four times a day during the 48 hours of their stay. Pain, distress, and anxiety scores were measured before and after, and yeah. total opioid intake was recorded every 24 hours during each intervention. Yeah, so how much morphine were they demanding? So we have a system in most hospitals here in the United States, I think overseas as well, where people get an allotted pain management, which may be something like, you know, paracetamol or Tylenol or ibuprofen. And then for worse pain, we have some of these like that are on demand, right? Um, so you're either getting like a continuous amount of opiates and then you push a button to get more, uh, or you call your nurse and say, Hey, I need, you know, I need more medication. So they were seeing how often people would demand or ask. Um, now while initially there didn't appear to be any difference between the two groups, when they actually did the meta analysis, there was a small, but noticeable difference in scores with people feeling slightly less anxious during their ICU stay with essentially background music. But when we're looking at surrounding surgeries, perioperative music, so playing before and after, reduced opioid consumption of all kinds by 4.4 milligrams or milli equivalents for at least 24 hours after surgery. Now, if we're giving, let's say an average dose is about two milligrams of an opioid every four, three to four hours for, sure. for most surgeries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're looking at, you know, again, two milligrams, that means it's going to take you at least eight hours. And just hearing music before and after surgery reduces eight hours worth of pain control. That's a lot. That's a lot. I, I really, really like that. Yeah. Now, if you went for 72 hours with music, you got a reduction over those time periods of nine milligrams of opioid milliequivalents. 
and the reason this is important is when you start using a lot of opiates after surgery, it slows down your gut and makes you constipated, which keeps you in the hospital longer, which increases cost. The longer you're in the hospital, yeah. you're at risk for other things happening. Yeah. And if you if you overdo it for any reason, right? So if there's a medical error or you get too much, now you're at risk for toxicity and overdose. So anything we can do to reduce that use of that is great. So a lot of these just show, you know, again, none of it specifies what kind of music, which I feel like if I did a scientific study, I'd be shouting from the, or maybe these people are just ashamed of their music choices. Because I don't know <laughs> that there's a standardized music selection, you know. Okay. Yeah. Santos. That's true. Yeah. Make a playlist for your, uh, your mice. Like, you know. <laughs> um, well, I could do it for my kids, but there's going to be a preponderance of baby shark and, you know, wheels on the bus. But yeah. All right, all right. Let's. We're going to come back to this idea of a playlist later. Hold that yeah. thought. But yeah, so music that unspecified music, presumably music of a wide variety, does right. reduce your use of pain medications and some preoperative anxiety, but doesn't do as much as would be hoped for people in intensive care, which I suppose makes yeah. sense given that, you know, there's a lot of going on where they maybe can't focus as much even on the therapeutic effects of music. Yeah. And it's, you know, these are smallish studies. It's kind of sad, Josh, but you know, we've got a lot of stuff to study and learn, et cetera, kind of a thing when it comes to trying to get, you know, funding and effort for these kinds of studies, which I think could make a big difference in people's lives unfortunately it's not going to get a ton of attention like you know this isn't going to get the same type of funding and, and attention as i'm creating a cure for cancer kind of thing so now, it's, it's good i think it's very good because recovery post-op is something that I, almost all of us may experience sometime in our lives and this decreasing pain effect goes across various uh genres disciplines because well, you're talking know. about different music or yeah or different... well different conditions oh um, okay for yeah. example migraines an open label randomized trial was done in the philippines in an emergency room from july 2017 to 18 and anyone who came in with a migraine fulfilling criteria was included they okay. either got medic just normal medical therapy or medical therapy with music medicine. And overall, they got 183 adult migrainers without okay. difference between the group, uh, which varied in age, gender, occupation, with a statistically significant reduction. And, you know, for you math geeks out there, P was equal to 0 0.037. Yeah, in, not huge, but okay. Yeah, in pain severity after one hour in 82 of 87 patients in the medicine, in the music arm. Yeah, it's, it, that's really, really nice. So essentially the difference was they had 87 patients in the music arm. They had 86 patients that didn't get music. They just got medical therapy. And if you, if you just took it by percentage, 94% of the people who got music got a really nice, you know, reduction in pain severity versus 85% of the people who got medical therapy alone. And Josh, this is, I'm going, you know, this is pain. So there's a lot of subjectivity to it. And there's going to be, you know, variability in terms of what a person perceives as pain or better or any of this kind of thing. So it's not super objective, but it's important to the individual because, you know, for them, their pain is what matters. Well, the next study I found was also in the ICU, but rather than looking to reduce anxiety, this physician went to try and study how to reduce the number of delirium days. So days that people were confused or agitated or, oh, wow. you know out of their minds, essentially, which is 
not uncommon in an ICU. I think there's an important thing here, Josh, is that we think about delirium often in elderly people that are, you know, they already have, you know, a degree of dementia or something like that. That's not 100% true. Because you don't have normal stimulus of sometimes you're missing, you know, sunlight and sunset, you know, you don't have clocks enough around you. It's an unfamiliar environment and you're sick. Even a person who was well, you know, otherwise, you know, mentally healthy outside of the ICU, they're stuck in there for long enough. This type of delirium or, or loss of, you know, the ability to understand where, when, what you are, right? It can happen to, you know, anybody. So this is, of all the studies that we've mentioned, and probably the ones we're going to, this is my favorite. Uh, okay. Because, con, con! <laughs> um, yep, <laughs> con was at all. Finally, <laughs> finally, no, no, I'm not even giving credit to the rest. This oh, man, okay. this man decided... <laughs> <laughs> to actually give the methodology and answer the questions we've been asking. So okay. each each of the 52 patients in his case had undergone mechanical ventilation in the ICU for at least a day with just silence or you know normal ICU sounds and then were assigned to a control, no music, or one of three treatment groups. Treatment group one, listening to personalized playlists based on their music taste, general, okay. you know, and that was provided by family or friends if the patient couldn't, generalized okay. relaxing music chosen by a hospital music therapist, or an audiobook such as Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> Which is why... <laughs> This is like anxiety provoking. No, <laughs> this is not no, a control. No, because I don't know. I don't always listen to the radio. I commute and listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks. So maybe yeah, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Okay, I mean, well, this is like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, personally, I would have gone with Stephen King's The Stand, but you know, to each their own. So regardless, everybody relaxes in their own way. Sure. <laughs> regardless of the treatment group, every patient got a two-hour-long session each day for a week. And then they assessed patients daily to evaluate delirium and pain for two weeks. 80% okay. of the patients said they enjoyed listening to the music, I guess, compared to the podcasters and audiobooks. Sure. <laughs> and among the groups, the general relaxing music chosen by the therapist resulted in the most delirium free days on average okay. three to four of the seven. And oh, the bad. lowest and the lowest severity on the active delirium days. So, you know, the music therapists know what they're doing. Now, okay. based on his pilot trial, Khan, Khan <laughs> secured funding for a second trial for a confirmatory trial through the Sound Health Initiative, which is a partnership between the NIH, the National Institute of Health, and the Washington, D.C., John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, along with the National Endowment for the Arts. Very nice. Okay. All right. So let me give it up just so, you know, people aren't envisioning, you know, Montablon <laughs> going through the ward. No. Dr. Babar, stop it. Dr. <laughs> Babar Khan, Associate Professor, uh, Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care and Sleep and Occupational Medicine at Indiana University. And uh, yeah, kudos on his work uh, and everything that he did. Um, and yeah, published in the American Journal of Critical Care. I, I, I think this is absolutely amazing. And the Zooming in on providing reassurance, calming, and, uh, you know, help for delirious patients, which, Josh, not too long ago, you know, maybe 1960s, 70s, this kind of a thing, like, we used to shut these people in, like, dark rooms and just load them up with meds because they were either too much trouble or we didn't know. Now we give know, them a it. disco ball and electronica playlist. Yeah, exactly. I think that's absolutely amazing. And we're more than anything else, even in the midst of their delirium, we're acknowledging their humanity and their need for 
you know, real type of, you know, stimulation and something to actually soothe them and make them happy rather than to just like, you know, shut the problem away or something like that. I, I'm so excited by this. This is beautiful. Now, music can get your heart pumping and your feet thumping. So <laughs> you can actually, an article in uh, in Harvard Health shows yeah. that music therapy has direct physiologic effects on your heart. Ooh, so good. Yeah. Um, so patients who were confined to bed who listened to music for 30 minutes in general had overall, compared to controls, lower blood pressure, slower heart rates, and less distress. And that was at Massachusetts General Hospital. Heart Yay. attack survivors who listened to restful music in a quiet environment for just 20 minutes were overall had shorter hospital stays. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about pain. It also dilates the blood vessels. Oh, okay. So, you know, lowering blood pressure and actually increasing perfusion to your tissues. Right. So when we're talking about lowering your blood pressure, that's what it does for your actual cardiovascular system. It causes your blood vessels to dilate or expand to increase blood flow, which is also seen when you laugh or have other joy inducing activities. And that's what lowers your blood pressure. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I actually, I love the, the, you know, the study itself that you sent over, Josh. So this is all the way back in 2008, right? Is that what um, University of Maryland Medical Center or the other yes. one from Mass? Yeah, this one, this one's 2008. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So the 2008 study that you sent over, um, you know, beautiful, just not too many people, uh, but they went through these four phases. So um, they listened to music that evoked joy. Right. And then the volunteers brought recordings of their favorite music to their lab. Um, and then the let's see, the next phase was listening to music that made them feel anxious. <laughs> And then the uh, session three was a relaxation audio tape, which for the non eighties audience in the room <laughs> was yeah a cassette tape where and these were really big, Josh. When we were kids, do you remember like you'd hear a soothing voice saying, "Relax your muscles." you are at peace, <laughs> you are safe. And if you were in the wrong frame of mind, this thing felt creepy as all get out. <laughs> was there then, a right frame of mind for it? No, no, I don't <laughs> think there was. But the final, um, the final bit, and you're going to absolutely love this, was comedy. So they were shown videotapes designed to induce laughter. So <laughs> they went through all of those phases uh, to test this out and then look at the you know, blood vessel dilation and all this. And um, I think, you know, this was an absolutely wonderful way because everything else so far that we've talked about, you know, by and large has been kind of subjective. How's your pain? How's your anxiety? But this is an objective view of how the music kicks in, you know, the, the chemistry in your blood and sends signals to your actual physical parts to relax and open up. <laughs> Don't do it when you want to get to yeah. it. <laughs> so it was, it was so good. Um, yeah. So most participants, uh, just because of where they were, selected country music as their favorite to evoke joy. Uh, heavy metal for anxiety. <laughs> but this was just, you know, this was weird. A exact opposite reactions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I think it was a really cool thing. And, you know, this guy, Dr. Miller, was funded by the American Heart Association's Veterans Administration in the NIH. So really, you know, I, I'm, I so applaud the investigator, but also the associations for recognizing that this is an important intervention and should be studied and funded. Um, absolutely cool. So, so cool. So those of you who follow or have found our Twitters, or Facebook. Uh, what Please would be tell on, us where they are. Yeah. No. What would <laughs> be on your your medical playlist? So if you yeah. you were I don't know packing for a hospital stay, what are yeah. you throwing on there? And and Santosh and I will will put up at least a list of what 
what ours are. And at some point we may even get that up onto Spotify. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Like what, what would make you feel better? What would make you feel more upbeat you know, preoperatively, postoperatively, reduce your anxiety, increase your blood flow to your heart, all that good stuff. So, as I said, your heart a thumping and your feet a bumping. No, wait, <laughs> strike that, reverse it. Reverse it, reverse it. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> and yeah. since, <laughs> since yeah. the 19, since the 1940s. Yeah. Clinicians and scientists have noted that walking to the rhythm of a metronome or organized music can help steady the gait of a Parkinson's patient, which is important because they have very tiny kind of wobbly steps that make them more prone to falls. Yeah. So walking is a really, really complex movement, right? It is not... It's not serial firing of various muscles, you know, just, you know, that's not activated like boom, 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 you know. Let me hear you say, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There is actually a, a, a clock or a rhythmic center that coordinates many, many parts of our brain, including our cerebellum, our motor, motor cortex, uh, all of our sensory cortex, and it runs through the center of our brain, the thalamus, um, to help give ourselves a, a rhythm and motion to our walk, which is smooth. And that's why, Josh, a lot of the time you can walk and do other things at the same time. It's an automatic type of rhythm. Now, when you start to lose the beautiful dopamine producing neurons in your basal ganglia, the, the gray matter that surrounds the thalamus, uh, that, that natural rhythm goes away and you have to kind of try to do these smooth, natural motions, okay, because the wiring for that smooth naturalness is now gone. And so, you know, when you're moving, you end up with a tremor or a judder. When you try to do a complex motion like walking, which involves movement, balance, speed, everything at the same time. It, it goes wrong pretty quickly. So now what you're doing here is you're setting an external rhythm. You're, you're, you're basically creating an external basal ganglia to some extent. So to select patients for the study, they took patients who had known Parkinson's disease and they assessed each patient's ability to perceive rhythm. Yeah. So they said, can you tap your finger to the beat of music? walk to mm -hmm. the beat of music and synchronize your footfalls with the beat of music. And if the answer to all those questions was yes, and they didn't have two left feet as it were, mm -hmm. they then underwent one month of therapy where they walked to the rhythm of a German folk song for 30 minutes, three times a week. Okay. I don't know why a German <laughs> folk song. That no. So the German folk songs, like if you go to Oktoberfest and you hear the accordion music, like a, yeah, so a, a polka, creepy. Uh, well, polka is from Poland, right? So this is still, you know, a little bit, you know, more Bavarian. So, but it's the same kind of thing. Um, it it has How's a it very Bavarians. What? Ah, No. <laughs> Well, the the main thing about all of these tunes is that they have a very um, straight, easy to follow, distinct rhythm, usually in four four time, right? So that it's it's not very complex or something like this, and it allows you know uh, a, either a two beat or a four beat rhythm that when you sing it, for instance, you you know you go to a German beer hall and you start singing everybody can bang their beer steins or clap their hands or stomp their feet in unison because it, it has a natural rhythm to it that a lot of people can follow without a problem. So you don't want to make it harder on the Parkinson's patient. You want to make it really, really easy to find the beat. Patients who could find the beat um, can and could feel the beat in the rhythm mm -hmm. of their heart. <laughs> or the rhythm of the night ended up having the greatest and the greatest improvements and the longest lasting improvements following the interventions 
Um, but everybody did improve following a month of therapy. So uh, I actually loved the study and it made a lot of sense to have a straightforward kind of rhythm to help people with Parkinson's. Uh, but I found another one in neuro rehabilitation and neural repair from 2010. And this was Dr. Madeline Hackney and Gammon Earhart. They, Josh, Sometimes, you know, the rhythm with the German music is good, right? But what really, really gets your rhythm going? Feeling the your your feet tapping to the sensual beats of the Argentine tango? All right. <laughs> yeah. Top three tango scenes. Sense of a woman. Good one. Yeah. Uh, true lies. <laughs> Ooh, oh, yes. Do it. Do it slowly. Um, <laughs> and, of course, the Adams Family. Oh. <gasps> Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Tish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Argentine tango for sure. It takes rhythm. It takes smoothness. It takes motion. But most importantly, Josh, is that you work with a partner that can actually teach you as you teach them. So this program, uh, which was in 2010 in Washington University in, in St. Louis, they recruited patients with Parkinson's disease, and they assigned them to either partnered tango, you know, where they were with a partner, or non-partnered tango, where they were learned but without a partner, one hour classes twice per week, and finished out 20 lessons. And then they evaluated balance and gait, G-A-I-T, which is how you walk, um, on, you know, very uh, rigorous scales. So they call it the Berg balance scales. And Josh, you know, the the folks, both groups actually really improved uh, on the on the balance scale, um, comfortable walking and fast as possible walking for, uh, you know, velocity. So, you know, half hour, half hour. and they actually tested the same thing you were talking about, rhythmic cadence walking. So could they walk matching the beat? And they maintained that improvement at one month after the follow up. Um, but. Here's the cool thing. The non-partnered class improved as much as the partnered class, but when they did the partner class, they said they liked it more and they wanted to continue. Well, yeah, the is, saying isn't it takes you to tango. Yeah. <laughs> so it was neat because we're talking about things like, you know, adherence, like if you're going to keep up with the program and that kind of thing. But the people, of course, who, you know, you know, they were in a partner dance. So they were like, yeah, I'd, I'd come back and, and keep doing it. Um, but yeah, both groups, you know, learning how to tango uh, did much, much better in their walking tests. Last but not least, you've heard a lot of, you know, musical uh, segues. Yes. Or. Yeah, absolutely. Or asides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason for that. Turns out, just sing-songing anything, whether it's music lyrics or others, can also help improve your speech, especially in patients who have had strokes. Yeah. So we're talking specifically about people who've had strokes to their language center which for most people is on the left side of their brain in the temporal lobe. And you can kind of imagine that like right in front of your ear. You know, if you put your, you know, your, your hand almost to your temple, but a little bit behind, there's two amazing areas that we all have called the Broca's and the Wernicke's areas, which help process language for us so that we understand. And also so that we can express or speak or write language. And this is, Josh, very specialized centers. Again, it's not just yeah. You know, things don't work. Nikki, right? Your language will be broca. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, you, if you have damage to Wernicke's area, you have difficulty understanding language by and large. If you have language, you know, a, a stroke to Broca's area, but you speaking have it stress. with Wernicke's, yeah. you have a very fluid. You just babble a lot of nonsense. <laughs> exactly, but and you have trouble understanding others as well. Right, exactly. Um, but then Broca's, maybe you understand people pretty well if, if that area is damaged, but you cannot express yourself, writing, talking, all this kind of a thing. However, Josh, go ahead. <laughs> However, yeah. clinical scientist Gottfried Schlag at the University of Massachusetts <laughs> Medical School yeah. tested whether a form of singing called melodic 
intonation therapy helped mm-hmm. patients recover. And <laughs> patients... Of course, he's at Harvard, so the acronym he had to use was MIT. <laughs> um, patients sang simple phrases such as, I am hungry, in a pattern of alternating high and low pitches, while simultaneously... I am hungry. I am hungry. I am hungry. I am hungry. While tapping a... <laughs> <laughs> while, <laughs> while, while tapping, while tapping to the, while tapping to the rhythm with their unpaired left hand, <laughs> compared with a control treatment, which was an alternative form of speech therapy, and of course with a control of no treatment, the pilot study found that melodic intonation more rapidly improved the ability to speak, which was also yes. backed up by functional magnetic resonance imaging and i know all mris are functional but this is a special <laughs> kind that measures blood flow with dramatic changes to the language centers of the brain after repeated sessions with increased activity and connectivity between vocal motor or speech motor functions josh i i thought this was so cool so it seems like it seems like our region of our brain or regions of our brain that help us recognize and express music are a little bit separated from you know well, straight you up. You keep them separated. <laughs> <laughs> One is wasted and the other's a waste. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, the music, you know, thinking about tone, rhythm, and what we call prosody, which is our ability to um, emote, right? The the emotion in our language and that kind of a thing. It's not... I really... second that emotion. There you go. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. Yeah, we're going all over the place, by the way. 80s, 90s, it doesn't matter. So the, it's very interesting that those regions that help us control music or or understand music and everything they don't overlay perfectly one to one with our ability to speak or express ourselves with you know any kind of a language including written language right there, there's some overlap but not a ton but the whole idea here josh is that if you can't get someone they they have a lesion or a stroke in broca's area so they can't talk so you try to get them to just say hello and they'll just balk so the you know, that kind of a thing, it'll, it'll stop. And, and, you know, instead of trying to just get him to say something, all right, let's, let's use the musical parts of our brain to teach our vocal motor. So our speech centers, the, the part that helps us move our mouth, tongue and vocal cords in order to produce sound properly. And Josh, it's so neat. You know where this originally came from? This is so cool. If you have a person in your clinical practice that has aphasia, they they can't speak properly. One of the first things you can do to assess how they're doing is say, okay, don't talk. You don't have to talk. Sing happy birthday. You know, either hum it or with or without the words. And Josh, you have to remember this is after it's it entered the public domain, right? So you weren't paying the <laughs> So you're so, not getting sued. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And people who don't know, yes. But happy birthday used to be owned by two little old ladies and you have to pay them royalty. But yeah, because it's such a familiar tune, you could get people to either hum or sing, or in some cases, people who couldn't talk could sing the words to happy birthday, meaning that that ability for speech was somehow intertwined and locked away in the musical parts. So here, yeah, we were able to get the the musical parts of the brain to move over and kind of help Broca and Vertiki's area. And Josh, it really did help um, the folks, the, the people who were recruited, right? It helped the folks who had exclusive expressive aphasia. So more difficulty with expressing themselves rather than the people who had the, the receptive aphasia, the ones who were, you know, had trouble understanding. So Wernicke's area, they had a more difficult time with this therapy. Um, they, they didn't get as much of a benefit. So find a way to uh, sing a little bit every day or, yes. or rap or beatbox or just add, add a little toe tapping to, <laughs> to your life. 
Oh, it's so good. And it's so important. And, you know, I hope now all of you guys know it's not just pain. It's not just anxiety. It's for all different types of aspects of health uh, that music can aid you in, in rehabilitation. And Josh, we hope and also maintaining health as well. So so give us your, your medicine playlist or your health playlist and yeah. see if you can figure out how many songs we mentioned in this episode yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh and we'll put up that playlist on on twitter and or spotify yeah we can we can put that together and you know if you guess enough or you know if you ask us for a pin we'll send you a pin yeah we've got <laughs> if you can come up with all the songs we'll send you a prize oh yeah yeah we could do that yeah yeah we got these cool little pins now <laughs> so that's it for this week as always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and concerns. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are in the show notes, along with links for further reading. The show is produced by me with a lot of help from Dr. Santosh and friends. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Leisure. And until next time, as always, wait, wait, wait. keep... Josh, S sing, sing the outro. Trucker Doc! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Our... sing the outro. Yeah. And until next time... As always, keep a song in your heart, soap on your hands, a shot in your arm, and hit the road. Happy <laughs> travels, trucker happy doc. Travels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the adventures of trucker doc are coming. You bet your ass they are. <laughs> honk, honk. <laughs>